Now again, check that there's no rubber dam trapped. And again, we're stuck on the mesial papilla. So I'm going to take the tharp carver again. You can take a plastic instrument, you can take a carver, and you want to gently deform the band so it slides into the gingival sulcus and gently move the gingival papilla out of the way. Then tighten it up again so it hugs that tooth below the height of contour. Check again. Now it's in the sulcus. Now it's not stuck on the dental papilla. Okay, we would favor trying to wedge from the palatal because that's the larger embrasure and therefore needs more adaptation. The green wedge will fit nicely from the distal palatal. The mesial because uh, we've got a canine there. The space is much bigger, so we found that the white wedge was the right width, but not the right height. I'm gonna reach your hand piece and get a burr. I usually use a diamond, but it doesn't really matter. There's a diamond there. And I'm going to lower the height of the wedge. Because right now, that wedge is so tall, it's actually, it's actually pushing the matrix band away from the tooth, from the contact. So you see I've lowered that height in the middle. We're going to test it, we're going to place it and see if that was adequate or not. You do it on the Akuza portion where they... Up the wedge lower? Right. Yeah, that's correct. Now, can I burnish the matrix into contact with the canine at this point? Your, cam your camera is just blocking my right eye. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I think we can deform that band, but we'll have to really lean on it during the condensing as well. All right, so now let's make sure our instruments are all ready for us in sequence. When I go to carving, I'll use the G38 first, then the third, then the cleoid discoid. For condensing, I just want a range of two condensers. That's four ends all together, which is one more than I need. You check your carrier that it's free running, not blocked. Check that the screws are tight, that it's not going to fall apart. Take the dappen dish with you. at the amalgamator. You only need to pick it up with your carrier two or three times. You don't need to plunge it in there many times. I'm going to start at the mesial. Okay, my little nurse, okay, and, and as soon as you put one in, check that it's free running, keep it running, so the amalgam doesn't set up in there. Start with the smallest condenser. My little nursery rhyme is always start with the worst first. So where your contact that looks the worst, that needs the most stretch, start there first. Because while you're condensing, you need to pull that matrix band into place uh, in the contact. So not only do we need to condense hard, but you need to also be condensing against the matrix band. At the same time, you want to get some of that really, really fresh, soft amalgam around those pins while you have the best opportunity to flow and condense it around the pin. Because you don't have a lot of room. Two, three, carry it in. Again, at the worst first, make sure this is still running. 
first lightly tuck it in so it doesn't fall out and into the patient's mouth. Make sure it's anchored somewhere in some little corners and line angles, point angles. Okay, and then really lean on it. Now what you don't see, you, you don't see me bending my fingers a lot like this. You see me rocking on my rest finger and the power is coming from my upper arm, my shoulder. I mean, I can feel it in my upper arm. Now you should anticipate that you're going, in a large restoration like this, you should anticipate that you're going to have excess amalgam squeezing out between the matrix and the tooth. You're going to have all kinds of excess to change now. Your permite is setting up a lot faster than the last demo. So that may either the, be the setting on the amalgamator or we've got, is this regular set or extended? Uh, it's extended. This is extended? Yeah. Then something's wrong in the amalgamator settings. Okay, don't use all of the amalgam because in the time that you're mixing it will be setting. Take a notch off the timing. So if you reduce the timing it becomes softer? It, it doesn't mix as well. Not all amalgams follow the rules of uh, how they behave when you change the time, the rules that are published in your textbook. But the, it looks good, it's shiny. It's uh, this feels softer right from the get-go. Now let's start to get some into the distal box. So again, touch it lightly first so it's anchored and doesn't fall out. Then make sure you get it into the point angles, into the line angles. And yes, we're gonna have a, a funny truncated shape to that tooth initially, because the, the matrix band is a truncated cone. It's not contoured like the tooth. So now the pins are pretty well covered and we can put a little bit more in. You have to be careful too when you're condensing that you don't squash your pins. So you need to keep a maintain an awareness of where your pins are. Again, I'm pulling the, the matrix band towards the contacts and pushing and condensing towards the contacts. All right. This mix is better, just uh, we made a variation of one second and I'm getting a much better What's response. What's the setting you have on the old one? What did you move it to? Nine? I think I moved it from nine down to eight. Nine, eight. And make sure it's, uh, the, um, the cycles per second stays at M2. And this one's doing so well, I've got the time that I can take more of this out. Now in practice, when I was doing very large restorations, I had something called a mechanical condenser. The brand was Condenser. There are two kinds of mechanical condensers, ultrasonic and mechanical. I don't like the ultrasonics because some people suggest they release more mercury into the atmosphere. It, it, it goes on the uh, on the high speed yeah high speed uh, airline. Oh. Right now somebody's borrowing it to do an exam on December fifth. So if you had a mechanical condenser, you could put all of the amalgam in there. Now again, light touch first, just to get it into place. And then a firm condensing to make sure the layers adhere to one another. 
uh, at this stage with the mechanical condenser I would have picked up the whole amalgam ball set it on there and well it goes on, on your airline and it, it's this in a handpiece and it makes an awful racket okay this is really mushy I may have to compromise uh, add another half a second to it again and largest condenser now the reason I ex accepted the band being a little bit too short is to show you that sometimes what we have to do I need another amalgam I will replace your uh, amalgam later Sometimes we have to make arbitrarily a little mountain without the aid uh, without the aid of a matrix band. So you have to condense towards the center. And we're just going to have to, on our own, arbitrarily go higher than the matrix band. We can't stop at this height because the pal to cusp would be too short. And that's a functioning cusp, and we want to restore the patient back to function. Well, it's coming right now. Yeah. So, you're going outside of me. Yeah. Is that hopped in like often? Yep. When you get into big projects, if you're willing to do the big project, the answer is yes. So, see, now we're going up higher than the matrix band. Again, keep that running. Yours needs a this needs a little work because it's getting it's sticky. All right. That said, now you can use the side of the condenser as well, like that. Okay. We'll grab some more. Use the side. Isn't that not enough pressure to condense? At this point, we actually have to reduce our condensing pressure a little bit. Okay. Because, because we've got to keep that mountain together. See now, I'm condensing towards the center. Like in the lecture, I said some confusing words. I said when you have a bump higher than the band, you got to condense towards the center of the mass. You can't just go straight down from the top because you'll explode it outward. Okay, so now we've arbitrarily recreated the height. So, now, so on the slides, it had an excess, then I picked up the Explorer. I didn't show anything about instrumentation. Right now, we're just going to go all around, wipe away the excess, first from outside the perimeter of the band, and then we'll go around the inside of the band lightly, and go from tooth to amalgam. If you go from amalgam to tooth, because the amalgam is soft, you will sub-margin. All right, now I need to decrease my focal length a little bit. Because the matrix band was so low. Uh, the band was very no, same thing, still from tooth to amalgam. Because the amalgam is so soft, it'll let you dig in and you'll bump into the tooth and you'll have a sub margin. All right, finger on top of amalgam, band, and retainer all at once. Thumb under the retainer, hold it steady while you unlock it. Right now, you don't want to be torquing that soft amalgam. Leave the wedges in place while you do that. Now again, holding the finger on top while you remove the retainer. Now remove your wedges. Leave that on the floor. Now remove your wedges. One. Two. Now take your large, don't do the next thing with your finger because your finger is soft. Take a large condenser or anything big and flat like a plastic instrument Hold it on the amalgam, take the mesial, pull it towards the tooth next door, and if your band is nice and smooth, we should be able to come up and towards the lingual. Boy, I made a tight contact. 
okay, holding the amalgam down okay try the distal because we are so, there we go distal is going up into the lingual okay now I will warp this towards the mesial if it's really really in the way and stuck just take the scissor and cut your band smaller you know you could cut your band right here if you need to all right let's try this again see all right there we go see now my amalgam stayed together why don't you ever slide it out like, pardon slide it, slide it like buckle easily out Split well I, I'll, I may rub some amalgam off my contact I may do that after if if I did this once and I broke the amalgam then I might do it a different way okay what was step one in the seat in the seven seven steps that's step two step one flat top it at the height where you think your tallest cusp is going to be you can use existing tooth structure as your guide so just a flat top no contour just flat that's just giving you a reference point the reference point of your height now I'm going I'm going to no you I'm going to go a bit to the right and just get rid of uh, this really really big excess here just for now but I'll come back to that in step three all right step two was buccal and lingual profile viewed from this position if it was a mandibular I'd go where you're sitting I'd have the patient look towards me and I would eyeball down the mandibular arch because what I want to see right now I want to see that palatal profile okay back to my tharp And I'm going to use the profile of the five to guide me and the alignment of the palatal cusp. That's a Holland back, isn't it? Holland back, tharp. Okay. Okay. Okay, CT, CT 36 is Carver Tharp 36. Oh, okay. It's got the beaver tail. Okay. Okay, so I'm letting the five guide me for the angle, the palatal height of contour, the palatal profile. I'm only carving mesial distally, I'm not going into the embrasures yet. From an occlusal view, I can keep the cusp tips lined up. Okay, now from a direct view, well, the height of contour goes in the middle of the middle third. Okay, so now if you look at it from the occlusal, it looks like it's just carved straight. <laughs> from mesial to distal the next step is viewed from the occlusal your buccal and lingual embrasures so that's where we go next I'm going to do my distal lingual embrasure notice my blade is vertical Then my mesial embrasure, I'm going to take a direct view, come over here a little bit, swing, notice my arm across the patient and coming from the right. Now what else was peculiar, what did you learn was peculiar about the mesial of a maxillary 4? Mesial concavity. Mesial concavity, what about higher up towards the occlusal? The mesial groove right yeah and okay. the fact that that groove causes a a dip or uh, al almost shaping that number four like a kidney bean okay now to the buckle embrasures because we had all that excess over here I'm going to want a thinner blade so I'm going to use the G38 so I can get into proximally This also lets me check on any overhangs or bad gingival contour. You like Dr. Jensen's interproximal carving. That's okay. You can like Dr. Jensen better. <laughs> what a wimp I am, eh? <laughs> All right. No, no, you're right. It's got a square edge to it. Uh, both have certain advantages and disadvantages because that one has a fatter diameter it that gives it the advantage of more strength if you have to carve something that's already hardened 
uh, but it's dis the fatness gives it the disadvantage of can't get as far into proximally. Okay, the next step was get your marginal ridges down to the same height as the neighbors. I'll use the beaver tail for that. Okay, uh, now you're blocking the light there. So let's get, all right, so I'll go distal first and I'm going to use the beaver tail. I'm gonna just very, very locally, very locally get that amalgam marginal ridge down to the same height as tooth number five until my beaver tail comes into contact with that tooth number five. So just getting that height down. Now, more difficult to do on the canine. On the canine, it's only the buckle half of the marginal ridge that can be matched to the canine. The buckle half, because the canine has no palatal cusp. It's got only one slope, not two. So we can only match the buckle slope. So just that. Then the next step was, now we've got marginal ridges the same height, but they got a sharp corner. We need an occlusal embrasure. So I'm gonna stand my carver vertically. I'm gonna go a little deeper into that embrasure. And later on, we may be retuning this as a, a follow-up time. All right. So now we've got the height, we've got the profile, we've got the embrasures. Now we're going to start to We'll sketch in our central groove because we're going to start the occlusal anatomy. Initially, I'm just going to shallow carve it. Now, there's something else. What else did we learn about the position of the palatal cusp on a maxillary four relative to the buccal cusp? It's a bit more twisted. Which it, it, it's okay. More yes, twisted. yes. Yeah. It helps to create that idea of a kidney bean shape. Uh, All right, okay. so I'm going to make the lingual distal embrasure bigger to give the sense that the cusp is definitely twisted. What, what song is that out of? Definitely twisted, I heard the wedding bells, it could be heaven, it could be hell. Where does that come from? My mind is definitely twisted, and now that's going to bother me. There, there's, that's from a song. Okay, I'm going to shallow carve. I'm not disturbing the cusp tips anymore. I'm going to shallow carve the central groove, but it's going to go from mesial fossa up and down to distal. I can now, I want to now carve on the buckle, but crossing over is awkward, so first I'll ask the patient to lean way over here. Now crossing over this way is easier. I'm doing this indirect. The, the mirror is doing, giving me the vision. I gotta go a little deeper at my distal marginal ridge area. I don't have a distal fossa yet. Okay. Now, if you stopped at this point and your occlusion was okay and your contacts were okay as confirmed by floss and after you took the rubber dam off all your gingival margins were flush with the tooth then you could say okay call it a day but I won't stop there. I'm going to go to my cleoid now. I'm going to start by going a little deeper just at a local point where I think the distal fossa should be. And I know that's got a triangular shape, the base of which is parallel to the marginal ridge. And the apex points towards the central groove going up and over 
the triangle, the transverse ridge. Now, supplemental grooves should not just be scratched randomly. They are the peripheral borders of your triangular ridges. And do the same thing now at the mesial. I can't make that fossa yet because first I need to constrict that mesial surface a bit. So I'm going to turn the patient over again. I'm going to we're going to trade places. I'm going to go back my back to patient's feet. And I'm going to stand my blade vertically because I'm going to make a bit more of a concavity here where the central groove crosses the mesial marginal ridge. Get my elbow off the patient's chest. Notice I got a finger rest there that's really important to stabilizing my carving. Now I need to have a look from the occlusal to see can if you that's... Work from the eight and nine in the maxillary? Can you work from eight? Well, that's what I'm doing. Like, is that allowed? The, the only thing that's not allowed is getting into your neighbor's space. Okay. Because you're using direct vision too, right? Yep. But with a little assist from the indirect here. See, it depends what gives my arm, my hand, the comfort to make the shape that I want. Okay, and it gotta come to here because I need to get interproximally. There we go. Now let's blend that into the central groove. Patient to the right, so I can cross over my arm. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm starting to make that mesial fossa leaning against the buccal cusp okay okay now leaning against the palatal cusp Hotel California. <laughs> the song was Hotel California. Sorry, before you were born. Eagles. Back in my hippie days. Oh, I shouldn't have said that on there. Uh... I forget you're taping this thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we've got a mesial fossa, we've got a mesial groove over that. Hopefully the buccal slope of the mesial marginal ridge is matching the canine. If not, we would have to adjust that further. Um, okay, distal marginal ridges match. Palatal cusp is twisted a little bit towards the mesial. Now let's see if we need to round off any other Taking a view from mesial to distal here now. Could make that central groove a little deeper. Is this class of 2018? Is that the, the right yeah. number? Yeah. Okay. Don't forget us. Listen, I, I've, I've enjoyed every class I've ever been with. I, I love doing this. So. Okay, so there you go. You can have a look at that, Jason. Contacts seem to be good.